Hello. Hello. Hello, Assalamu alaikum. Am I audible? Uh, okay, Assalamu alaikum. We have Fazan here. So that means uh, I just need some help from Fazan. Uh, Fazan, could you tell me if I am uh, I am audible? If it is if it is clear, because we need to do some uh, some quality control before we move on. So good, good. Thank you, thank you very much. So that that means we are there. First of all, let me apologize for the slight delay that happened. It was uh, because of some technical issues. So I, I just had to run all the things again and then try it again. And uh, I'm sorry for that. So, but but anyway, that happens. And, and, uh, I was very much looking forward to this session, WebEx five, uh, because of two important issues. Uh, one is that that the the number of people who from from Valley who represent themselves in AIMS is uh, going down. It's it's uh, we, we previously had a good number of people over there who were from Valley posting various courses in AIMS, and now uh, this number is is diminishing day by day. So that, that is one of the concerns that uh, was kind of haunting me for a long time. And uh, I must thank the Croatia Scientist Group for that. They give, uh, they, they invited me and gave me an opportunity to uh, discuss with you the issues and take you all to the process of uh, all the courses, uh, particularly the courses which involve research. Uh, in aims so so we, we will start building up uh, all these uh, things every time and then we, I'll try to uh, somehow bust some of the myths that that uh, that surround the concept of aims uh, as many people think that the aims entrance examination is very tough it's difficult uh, trust me I will bust this myth today I will tell you that it is one of the easy exams, not the easiest anyway, but 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 it is it is an easy exam, and if you prepare well, it's it's not that a difficult exam to qualify, particularly for the people coming from Valley, uh, given given their acumen about science. I I would tell you, it's 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 not that difficult for them, and uh, this will be one of the take home messages for you at least that anyone coming from the 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 value of Kashmir uh, and anyone having a, an average IQ if uh, works uh, if, if that fellow works uh, the works out works hard it's it's very easy to call it so uh, before we go on I think I must give some introduction of my own self uh, my name is Munib Pai I have pursued my doctorate in AIMS, AIMS New Delhi, because there are so many AIMS now. There is AIMS Patna, there's AIMS Rishikesh, there's AIMS Bhopal, there's, there are so many other upcoming AIMS around, but uh, the, the parent AIMS, that's the New Delhi AIMS New Delhi, which was established back in 1950s, in fact, 1956, by the Act of the Parliament, uh, I have pursued my doctorate there from the Department of Ophthalmology. So from there, I came here to pursue my postdoctorate here in the New York University School of Medicine. Uh, my work is, is uh, focused on imaging the brain. Uh, I, I have been working on the most common cause of uh, uh, irreversible blindness called glaucoma. And a few years back, we happened to publish a series of papers in which we found that glaucoma actually is not the disease of the eye, it is the disease of the brain. 
And now what, what we are trying to do is to look into the functional and the structural aspects of brain and trying to correlate it with the vision loss. So that, that's what we are doing in, uh, in our lab here in the New York University School of Medicine. So with regards to AIMS, AIMS is, well, it, it's, it's a huge institution. And since I, I have been there for a long time, so, so I, I kind of uh, may not have that much updated information about the processes that are going on right now, but I, I would fairly give you all those, all the idea of what's going on. So, so starting with the very basic courses from AIMS, AIMS offers the BSc courses, AIMS offers MSc courses, it, it of course it uh, offers the M MBBS and MD, MS, MCH, MHA, and uh, PhD. Uh, that is the doctorate courses. With regards to BSc, it's it's kind of it offers BSc honors and paramedical courses like BSc ophthalmic techniques and MSc technology. Then BSc honors in nursing. They can later on go to MSc honors in nursing. And uh, AIMS offers mm, MSc in Biotechnology, actually M Biotechnology, they call it MS in Biochemistry, MS in Pharmacology, MSc in Physiology, and uh, then MSc Perfusion Technology, MSc Nuclear Medicine, MSc Urolo Urology Technology, and then from BSc Nursing, people can go to pursue MSc Nursing, that is uh, in um, specialized nursing, MSc Nursing in Cardiology, MSc Nursing in Oncology, Neurosciences, Nephrology, Critical uh, Care uh, Sciences. And of course, then uh, MBBS, other other MDMS exams, and MCH as well as the PhD. So uh, a, a fair good course would be if somebody tries uh, to enter AIMS as early as possible in courses like uh, biochemistry, in courses like pharmacology, MSc, or in in uh, nuclear medicine, uh, or or the MSc courses, proficient technology. There are quite a few number of people from Valley who have already taken courses uh, for MSc in AIMS and there's one at least one person I know in nuclear medicine department who is pursuing his MSc and uh, probably his uh, he is preparing for a PhD program in AIMS so that is that that is that is the basics of it so but, uh, now from here we'll try to move on to uh, towards what is the process through which PhD happens in AIMS PhD exam is actually the, the the examination happens twice a year. AIMS exam is different from other uh, PhD exams in so many ways. Number one is that in other institutions, you appear in the examination uh, uh, if, if somebody has questions, I would I would try to uh, address them in between, of course. Uh, uh, here, Asan Hakurashi. Dr. Asan Hakurashi is asking, uh, he's uh, asking about research opportunities in neuroscience, which is one of the most emerging fields in life sciences. Yes, AIMS has this department called the Center for Neurosciences. They have they have some things called department, and then they have some of the departments coming together and forming a center. They have Center for Ophthalmic Sciences. They call it Rajendra Center for Ophthalmic Sciences. They have Center for Neurosciences and Center for Cardiovascular Sciences. Center for Neurosciences has uh, neurobiochemistry. They have uh, related neurosurgery. They have main neurology. So, so they have many small, small cluster departments together where they uh, uh, have a lot of students coming in who pursue research as PhD students. So, what happens actually is uh, there is one exam that is a common exam, but that common exam will have papers, written papers, and then uh, the viva voce that that the interaction with the uh, faculty who uh, the examiners which uh, which the select candidates take up. The important thing is that neurology center or the neuroscience center will have a separate exam, written exam, which will have paper coming from the neuroscience field. So if somebody is preparing for neuroscience examination, that fellow will have to prepare for neuroscience only. That fellow will have to appear, uh, clear the paper which has questions directly coming from the neurosciences. It is not like all biological sciences will be there. That is not the case. So in, in other research institutions where you, you have to qualify NET and more or less the syllabus is same and similar with other NET, uh, exam, net examination, 
that is not the case with AIMS. In AIMS, if you appear in the examination, the examination is like you have a written paper. The written paper has two sections. One is the objective and the other is the subjective. You have to qualify both objective and subjective. There is a portion in the both the papers where the questions directly come from the department on in which you want to go. So you have a choice of choosing a department in AIMS. Once you choose a department in AIMS and then you appear accordingly onto that uh, or, uh, accordingly and you prepare accordingly and then appear in the paper, uh, this examination and qualify and then you go for the interaction. And uh, I hope I answered your question. We have Dr. Riyaz Shah, can you give us first the details of bachelor's course eligibility and admission criteria? Yes, there are so many bachelor's courses. I was talking of BSc honors and paramedical courses that is ophthalmic sciences, that's medical technology and radiography. Then there's BSc nursing. The uh, overall the eligibility of these courses is 10 plus 2. Not only nursing, there's BSc honors and post certificate. There's uh, in, in these courses you have 10 plus 2 or equivalent with 50% of marks which is relaxed a bit with uh, the categories like SC, ST categories in which they, the candidate should, uh, should be having 45% marks, but rest the eligibility is 50% of marks. Uh, English, physics, chemistry, biology, or maths is the eligibility of, for these examinations. And the age bar of uh, these, these to, for the entrance of these BSc courses is around 17 years and above. Uh, uh, BSc nursing, however, uh, they were offering for females only but uh, somehow uh, may maybe they have they, they might have uh, uh, I don't know of the latest ones in 2018 but previously they used to take the uh, uh, females uh, candidates for PhD nursing only hope uh, uh, Riaz, uh, Dr. Riaz you found an answer okay yeah if, if there are more questions I would I would try to address them so with regards to PhD what happens is aims conducts the examination twice a year. There's the January section in session, then there's the June session. The eligibility again is MSc, you should have first division around the, the eligibility is master's degree in any subjects to al biomedical, allied biomedical sciences, master's degree. For nursing, it should be 60% marks and for others it's 55% marks. So, the important thing is the AIMS has two states of examinations. One is written and other is the interview. The written examination is not the same for all the departments. It's like in AIMS, all the departments will have their own papers and you, when you apply for an examination, they, advertise, they, they make an advertisement, you, uh, you apply for the examination, you apply for the entrance test, that you have to choose the department of your choice. In those cases, if, if you're trying to, if, if you're looking, aspiring for a PhD in biochemistry, then you can apply in only the Department of Biochemistry. If you're first trying to pursue your PhD in physiology, then you can apply in physiology only. Same, same goes with all the other departments. So AIMS has a number of departments that uh, provide a, uh, that uh, provide this PhD program. That's anatomy is there, physiology, these are the basic sciences where, where people pursue uh, PhD, but there are other departments also. What are the academic opportunities of BSc nursing to get an assistant professor position? Uh, Dr. Asif Bakshi, it's a very interesting question. Thank you for this. Actually, I think BSc nursing is one of the safest courses with regards to the career opportunities because after 12, if you if you pursue BSc nursing, your uh, your uh, actually your your job opportunities increase the moment you complete your BSc, and then you have an option to go for MSc, MSc nursing, and you have specialized courses as MSc nursing. And not only that, if you have done MSc nursing, you are eligible for a PhD course. Once you do a PhD course, and then you are a doctorate, you can you you can apply for faculty positions, of course. So in in medical colleges, what happens is generally most of the medical colleges have a requirement of some post PhD experiences. I I know of AIMS at least they have some few years of experience required for PhD uh, for for assistant professorship post PhD. So you you may refer to as a postdoc experience you must have, but nursing BC nursing people do have this uh, opportunity. They have job opportunities right from their BSc to MSc and then from there to PhD. 
hope that answered your question. Bilal Ra, hope you're doing great. Information about nuclear physics in Ames. Uh, Dr. Bilal Ra, yes, thank you for that. Actually, nuclear physics department uh, offers MSc as well as the PhD courses. We have one guy from Kashmir, he is uh, pursuing his MSc there. Uh, they are doing wonderful work, they are publishing wonderful, and they have wonderful students. Uh, their facilities are great. Their facilities are great. So if, if somebody wants to uh, do an MSc or a PhD in nuclear physics, uh, the person, for, for a PhD per se, the person has to apply for the PhD over there and then appear in the examination the way all the other departments conduct their examinations. It's single day examination. All the departments conduct the same day examination, but the papers are different. So if somebody is going to appear in nuclear physics, uh, it's it's nuclear medicine, not nuclear physics. So with, with regards to nuclear physics, that is uh, a different domain. I don't do much of physics, so I don't think I had the right person to answer that question. But yes, nuclear medicine aims to ask on the examination and provide PhD for that. Uh, Dr. Anha Bhatt is asking a question, what are the opportunities for internship for BSc Biochemistry and MSc Biochemistry courses? Uh, MSc Biochemistry people, MS, MSc Biochemistry students have been coming and doing their internships or six months projects in Ames for a long time now. I was one of them. Um, and there were so many people from my batch who came to Ames and did their six months internship or what you refer to as a six months project. And there are still people trying to come in, though the number has dropped for the last few uh, years, but there are still people who come in and do their uh, internships there. With regards to BSc, there's this like a no-no kind of an attitude for BSc people. Uh, but yes, sometimes BSc people also come for small short-term trainings, provided they have their recommendations from uh, the concerned departments. And the, the department, whose department who will be taking them for an internship or a project or a research project or training, uh, for that issue, they, 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 they will have to have, uh, they will have to talk to the concerned lab and the head of the lab and try to work it out with them. They can uh, write an email to them and tell them that I'm interested in this project or I'm interested in the, in the kind of work you people are doing and you people are publishing. And is there an opportunity that, uh, I, 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 I can do some training. I can go through some training and learn something from there. And in, in the process, I may. Uh, happen to learn some research and maybe publish some some papers if I uh, happen to want to do st some of your studies. So yes, M for MSc there have been uh, always people coming up. The procedure is the process is that you have to directly uh, communicate with the PI. You have to talk to the PI, write an email to him or her, explain him or her that this is this is the course I'm pursuing and this is the small part of it. This is what we call internship, and in this internship, this is six months internship or some whatever time it is. And I just am interested in your field. It is the way we, we write cover letters for postdoc positions. We write cover letters for other positions, PhD positions. It's the similar way. Somehow you write a letter or an email to them and then explain to them, uh, trying trying to get into the training or something like that. And in addition to that, if somebody is not enrolled in the MSc but is already an MSc, there are short-term training courses that AIMS provides, but they charge fee for those courses. The, those courses go from one month to uh, almost six months. You can, you can extend it here, and those are not per se academic uh, ones. That those, those are more or less observational courses that AIMS uh, provides. Zubair Ahmed Sofi uh, asks, uh, which are some of the best universities for PhD in zoology? Can a zoology candidate shift for other fields such as AIMS departments like NBRC? Of course, of course. It's, uh, if you have MSc zoology, you are eligible to apply to almost any department for, a post, you know, for the PhD program in AIMS and of course in NBRC. So since since you are you you have qualified your examination in biological sciences, that is all you need. So if uh, biochemistry people also uh, they also do the same uh, qualify the same net same GRF and zoology people also qualify the same net same GRF. So it's biological sciences as a whole. Let it be biochemistry, clinical biochemistry, biotechnology. They have a slight uh, advantage over certain things in biotechnology, but pharmacology pharmacology people also have certain advantages in certain departments. But yes, zoology people can take courses, PhD course in any department. 
uh, in AIMS if you wish to, provided you qualify the examination. That is that that is the prerequisite for every courses. Even if you have a neuros neuroscience MSc and you apply for neuroscience, you have to qualify that examination. Uh, and of course, uh, since you say NBRC, I, I believe many uh, research institutions, neuroscience research institutions around the country actually uh, do entertain people from zoology and even botany. I have seen people who come from the botany background appear in the examination in AIMS in highly clinical fields and they qualify and they pursue their PhDs there. Hope that answered your question. Okay, Dr. Yaz Shah is asking summer internship fellowship opportunities for bachelor's and master's students. Uh, I believe I have dealt with this question previously also. Uh, uh, I, I would repeat it for you is that for BSCs and MSc students, summer summer training users, summer internship program is like you have to approach the PI yourself. If you approach the PI yourself, you write to the PI and ask the question. Actually, present your candidature in terms of uh, you being a trainee, and then try to request them if you uh, if if they can adjust you into the lab for a certain period of time and try to uh, get you adjusted over there for, for the training. Zoology and Botany Master students can appear for PhD examination. Yes, yes, absolutely they can exam they can appear. Mm. Uh, Anha is asking, can uh, a normal MSc chemistry do PhD in radiochemistry? What is the scope of stream in terms of employment? Okay, uh, the issue is that MSc chemistry, people, uh, radio, radio pharmacy is kind of uh, a sub branch of uh, pharmacology. So pharmacology has many branches. Like we have it, it, back in Ames also we have an, uh, there we have uh, ocular pharmacology. We have other pharmacology units. Now if MSc chemistry is eligible for that, we uh, I'm I'm I don't think I have a complete knowledge of that because most of the time um, Ames takes students who are from biological background, but that is not always the case. In in biostatistics, there are people who come from actually bio, bio, from statistics background or, or the operational theory background who come uh, and appear in the examination and qualify. So it's not always a biological science person. It can be someone other than that. But actually, is it radio pharmacy and do they want a chemist for that? Uh, I am not sure, but yes. Uh, there are departments which are taking people from other than uh, biological sciences and not only that if there are some alternative medicine uh, people who have they also have certain edge over uh, so, so, uh, in, in certain departments like psychology people uh, have an edge in, in psychiatry departments uh, even if they have not done a clinical psychology course. so, so if, if they have uh, qualified the examination and if, if the requirement is such that you need a psychologist uh, they, they can take the, uh, them in the psychiatry department. Uh, Dr. Arshid Khande, thank you very much for your kind words. Uh, there's another question. How can MSc Botany Zoology equip themselves with bioinformatics tools? How beneficial will that be? Where can, be, uh, where can they be learned and they don't find substantial scope in our service? I think bioinformatics has a lot of scope. Bioinformatics, and this is now the age of big data. So, so bioinformatics is not, we cannot just scoop it down to a few softwares or online tools. Bioinformatics runs right away from basic statistics to analysis of your results, executing your experiments, even even going through the in silico experiments and then generating data, going to big data, sequence analysis, and from there, further networking analysis, signature analysis, disease analysis, millions of sequences being analyzed through them. So bioinformatics is not just a small tool. It's, it, it's a huge enterprise, which I think has applicability, as much applicability in every field as statistics does have. So, so, so to me, it appears that bioinformatics has a lot of, uh, lot of scope in every single field. So, uh, in terms of the syllabus, yes, we are, our syllabi are not that that much 
fine tune to the modern uh, requirements. I think yes, there, need, there there is a need to go back and revise the syllabi and try to find something, some some chapter, find some place for bioinformatics to get them in, so that bioinformatics, uh, the people who are not bioinformaticians per se, will also have uh, a skill set that involves bio bioinformatics because bioinformatics is really very important. It's as important as statistics in any field of biological sciences that you go in or not only biological sciences, I think in any field of science and technology that you go in. I, uh, now, now is the age of big data, it's the age of information technology, and it's the age of ethics. And these three are the one of the main pillars that, that are going to be the part of our curriculum in, in near future. So it's, I, I think all these three, see all these three uh, branches of studies are important and any, any anyone should be equipped well with all these three tools. Uh, do we have any other question? Uh, Dr. Yasha says, can you brief us about the PhD exam conducted by AIMS, how to prepare for it? Yes. Uh, so uh, thank you for this question, actually. This is th this is the crux of whole talk, actually. AIMS conducts exam twice a year, in January and in June. They advertise uh, the seats. Every department has a required number of seats. They advertise. What happens is every department communicates to the examination section of the administration, tells them that we have this number of requirements in these fields. There are sometimes a project is mentioned and number of seats against the project available against that project are mentioned. Sometimes what happens, particular department advertises a certain number of three, four PhD seats and they communicated this to the examination and administration department. And when the advertisement is made, there's a long list of seats available against each department and sometimes each lab where the project also is mentioned. This is the project and we want one uh, person for this. This is the project and we want two uh, PhD candidates for, uh, for this project. So when they advertise it, it's up to the candidate to look into it and just see which of the fields, which of the various seats fit their expertise, which fit their interest. Actually, the problem is that in AIMS, like in many other examinations, you have a choice of choice one, choice two, choice three. In AIMS, it's not like that for PhD. For PhD, you can apply it only in one department and in certain cases for only one project, where you may have one or two PhD seats. From that point of view, it's get, it gets a little tricky, it gets a little difficult, but the, the good thing is that you have paper tuned to the subject in that department and you will have to read that very particular narrow field and you will not have to go a lot here and there and read a lot and get a lot of substance. But at the same time, when you have to read a le lesson, more and more about lesson, that, that gets, gets a little bit technical. But the truth is that you can apply in only one examination. But again, the good news is that you have to qualify 50%, you have to get 50% of the marks in written examination in order to go to the uh, by, by in order to go to the uh, interview. So to be eligible for interview, you have to give, get only 50% marks. It's not like other examinations where you have to get the top, the certain number of seats, and then rest of them are not selected. This is not the case in AIMS. When you, you apply in the written examination, there's subjective and there's objective part. You have subjective as well as objective. You qualify them. You just get more than 50% in them. And then you go into the interview where you find a fair chance, where you, where, where you have to tell them, see, I am the candidate. I am really interested in this. I have these skill sets and I, I am actually the potential learner. That is the important thing. So at, at a level of entry for a PhD, if nobody is, you know, no, nobody is a jet flight. By the, by the way, anybody after completing a PhD is also not a jet flight. We are all, you know, all learners, all our lives. But there, when, when you enter into a PhD, you have to kind of provide your candidature for a learner. So yes, good thing is that you have to get only 50%, you have to cross that 50% bar. The tough thing is that you have to prepare according to that particular subject or particular project that, that sometimes becomes very difficult. But yes, it's not that difficult if you study because, you know, again, I, I was in, in the start of this talk, I told you that I would bust this myth 
that aims is uh, very tough it's the toughest examination i'm telling you if you prepare it's not that tough it's really not that tough uh did i miss any question uh next is dr asif bakshi what is the path a non medicine post graduate msc biochemistry biotech should take to require to be to get a progress to professor in a medical college like aims or skims what are the mca rules for for it uh i'm not sure about the mca rules for that but i think we already have one one of the examples when we were first in bsc back bsc biochemistry back in sp college we had a faculty he had no non medical background he was uh, he he didn't have biology in his plus 2 and then he uh, he 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 had complete non medical background no biology till his graduation and then started doing msc in medical, uh, this biochemistry and then he became a faculty there in sp college he was teaching us he was one of the very good faculty very respected ones and then he went on to become a faculty in university of kashmir so so uh, i i i think it's like to, nowadays all the subjects are coming in a, in a close grasp the, the the thing is that they're joining hands it's multidisciplinary it's interdisciplinary there's a person who is well trained in mathematics he does a great neurosciences there's another person who's well trained in zoology and then again he uh, or she happens to do very good in cognitive sciences so yes uh, the path is that you are eligible for a post graduation uh, biochemistry even if you are from non medical non clinical background non medical background uh and you can do msc in biochemistry i'm not sure about biotech but biochemistry i know i personally know all of the faculties and then you can go on to do phd once do you you do msc in a particular subject you are eligible for the net national eligibility test for that subject so if you apply for the national eligibility test for that subject that makes you eligible for all the all the subjects that the biological sciences include but then there are some, some other psc rules and public subscription rules for colleges which may have may be different with mca it's the medical colleges that uh, have their recognition and their, uh, it depends whether their courses are recognized in mca if they are recognized with mca then they 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 have they, they are eligible for the faculty position in medical colleges of course yes that is right dr muzaffar bar says what's the option for bsc students in this field bsc students have all options somebody comes in with a bsc you can do msc in and number of different subjects and i i can talk of aims aims provides many msc courses and not only msc at, at least aims provides phd in 33 different uh, disciplines so there's a lot of uh, lot of scope for bsc and and it, in fact i think bsc is the right time to start to looking into your to just trying to carve out your research career right from uh, right from there because after doing msc then you you get caught up in a lot of things preparation for examinations interviews and then you have to learn a lot of things like writing cover letter making your cv preparing examinations and then going traveling around from one place to another one state to another then looking for options outside then preparing for a gre examination doing aids many many things happen after you complete an msc so bsc is the right 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 time to start your your uh, research career in terms of uh, looking for opportunities yes uh, then there is question we have only few mri and ct machines in kashmir should our hospitals have more uh, machines in these terms in kashmir we are all still finding uh, with, uh, fiddling with old gamma cameras or uh, for scanning when the rest of the world is shifting to pet scans uh, this is a very relevant question Uh, as far as i know uh, skims also has recently got a pet scan they have got a pet machine so say i think they are doing pet scans but recently there was something in news that uh, their con the contrast was not available to them or maybe the contrast didn't get any approval that there were some issues with that uh, the the answer to every such question is yes we need so if you need do we need more mri yeah we need more of a facility of mri do we need more cts yes we do need and do we need high end machines yes we do need because this is important so so there are there are so many ways to do it one is that uh, the the faculty have to the faculty in these concerned the faculty uh, uh, in these concerned departments in these concerned institutions have to logistically work it out one way of getting all those facilities not only the cameras and 
gamma cameras, the MRI machines, and the CT machines, but the facilities per se for for, for for the use of the hospital in research and development as well as in clinical uh, as well as for in clinical settings the important thing is they have to write projects and bring in funds so so when, when they write a lot of projects when they write a lot of important grants these grants apply to the funding agencies like Indian Nostra Medical Research is there like DST is there um, Ministry of Science and Technology is there DBT the Ayush Ministry they, they have a lot of funds nowadays they, they have been flooded with money to grant for research project. So if the faculty and the researchers, even if it's a clinical faculty who joins hands with a research faculty, and then they try to write projects, and in that project, you, you will have manpower in terms of JRFs, SRFs, research scientists, but through which you can recruit people who have done these courses and are back in, in Valley who have not been able for some family reasons, logistic reasons, they have not been able to come out, but they are there. They're equally brilliant. They're equally brilliant. So if, if they write the projects, if, if the projects are granted, you have a lot of opportunities, employment opportunities for your own people. Then you have grants which you can use for purchasing chemicals, improving infrastructure in terms of MRI, CT, or PET. We have one PET. I think I think there are there is of course a need of additional modalities, not only PET, CT, and MRI. There are so many other now modalities like like uh, TMS, that's uh, transcranial uh, brain uh, stimulation. Then there's PERG pattern, electro uh, retinographies. There are many modalities that we need back home. And another way of it is to have a platform created by people who will then try to work it out. Uh, that we, even if we don't have funds available, how to work it out, how how to logistically work it out, and and bring these modalities back home, or at least try to get a discount for patients who have to move, go out of the state and uh, do these uh, issues there. And one more important thing is, do we have MRIs, CDs, and PADs, and fluorescence imaging, fluorescence physiological imaging uh, in live animals, for animals per se, for rats, for, for mice, that, that is the importance for research. I think that, that needs to be taken care of, that needs to be uh, thought about. Uh, Dr. Fazan Bhatt says, uh, could you please give us information regarding Tata Institute Fundamental ex uh, Research Examination for getting admission for PhD? Uh, I'm not uh, completely sure about Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, but many of my friends went there. They uh, appeared in the examination, so I can I can give you an idea about their uh, how how their examination worked. So it was like if you had net examination qualified, you didn't. You were not required to go for a written examination. You were directly asked to come for an interview. If not, then there was an examination for a PhD. For a PhD examination, uh, they somehow uh, used to ask aptitude questions, mathematics questions. That's that's uh, how I remember it a few years back. Uh, I'm not updated with that since today. But uh, I, I, I know that many of my friends who had net qualifications, qualified net examinations, they were directly asked to come for interview. And they appeared in the interview and some of them got the positions and they did wonderful research there. And TIR for that certain is the fundamental research is, is really a very good place to work. It's really a very good place to work. So there's another question. We have only a few MRI. Okay, I think I dealt with this. Do we have any other question? How important are interdisciplinary skills in today's research? I think, uh, our, uh, let me read the complete question. How important are interdisciplinary skills in today's research? Why is it important? And why should we move out of our limits to pursue it? And what can we do to encourage it? I don't think a biologist will become a good biologist unless and until he understands the principles of mathematics. You need to know 2 plus 2 equals in order to know that how many cells will be formed after pyomitotic divisions. You need to know some mathematical algorithms in order to understand how cells behave with each other. You need to understand some basic electrical circuits in order to understand how neural circuits work, how neural microcircuits work, how interneurons work. You need to have some idea about how these circuitry works. So, so when we are trained in them in BSc, what happens is we are, we are trained in, in broad subjects in, 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 in 
English, physics, chemistry, biology, and then from there you go tapering it down to your specialty towards your specialty. But important thing is when you go there and find you try to look into minute and minute things, what you're doing in PhD is you're actually applying statistics, you're applying bioinformatics, you're applying critical analysis at the uh, at the top of it, you are adding philosophy to it. That's why PhD is called Doctor of Philosophy. The, the issue is that you are looking into the philosophy of things. So philosophy involves it involves epistemology, it involves reason, it involves logic. Uh, so I don't think it is just the subject. Your subject is actually like like a rope which you hold to get a direction, but other parts of it which are I think as important as your particular subject which are statistics, which are mathematics, which are mm, bioinformatics, which are skills which are mm, maybe apparently not directly related to, related to your subject but they are very important. They are absolutely important. But I, 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 believe, I believe philosophy has, is, is one of the very important subjects in that, in that regard. We have another question from Dr. Nasir Wani. Okay. Another question is, please, could you suggest some books for PhD exam in AIMS? Okay, this, this is an important question, but the problem is that AIMS exam is department exam. It's like every, uh, whenever you appear in AIMS examination, you are appearing in biochemistry, you may appear in a project in biochemistry, you are appearing in uh, ophthalmology, you are appearing in medicine, you are appearing in microbiology. So there is, for all other examinations for AIMS, you might find those explorer books, but for PhD, it's very difficult to find such a book because every other year, there is a different project, there's a different requirement, which is available, and according to that project, you'll find a paper. So, so there is no concordance between two or three years consecutive papers that these were the questions or this type of questions will be asked because that is not the case with AIMS. With AIMS, if there's a project, suppose on human process factor alpha, the fellow needs somebody who has uh, an, a, a experience in PPPT gene at human process factor alpha, maybe some other genes, maybe Golgi bodies, maybe maybe the involvement of maybe Cal reticulin or something. So, so the paper will be surrounding around that portion only. So it is it it, it is like you you. Even if you want to write an explorer for AIMS, you will not be able to write a good explorer because it will not, it, it, it's not going to just guide uh, candidates to, in the right way. So the best way is to actually arm yourself with what you have till your BSc and MSc. And then when you apply in a particular field, when you apply in a particular department, you get a, an idea that you have to apply for, for example, ophthalmology. When I applied in ophthalmology, I was very much disturbed what to do. So what I did was I got an ophthalmology book, complete ophthalmology book, Kansky, and then I started reading it from cover to cover, whatever I got, and there's one more book of ophthalmology, Purana. And ultimately it was not that difficult because the reason is uh, that there are some general questions also that are asked, which are current affairs, it's a little bit of aptitude. So if you're good and a little bit of aptitude, current affairs and all that, what happens is that you have a good score there. And then even if you have some slightly lower score in others, in the subject that you're uh, that you're um, applying in, uh, but fairly, if you cross 50% of it, you have a chance to go into the interview. If you go to the interview, there you have a complete chance of presenting your candidature. So, so like an explorer, it's it's a difficult it's difficult to get an explorer. So, uh, Zubair Ahmed Sofi sir is asking, provide some information about J. E. Bill's exams and it's important for biology candidates in building his. Uh, of his career, should a candidate go for it? Absolutely, absolutely. You uh, actually, I think uh, it's always good to think in these terms that an arrow in hand is worth doing the push. So anything that comes your way, please understand it. Try to grab it. And if you're trying for higher higher ones, you don't like this, you go for higher one. But I think it's better to have a, have a catch on this and then try for higher. If you let it go and then think that you will get another one, that's always you leave. You are leaving things to chance. There are other competitors on uh, on that level, and then there are other competitors on that level. So you have competition on each level. That would indicate that the position that you are getting, grab it, and then if you want to get higher ones, you have every right to go there. 
so yes so i i, I would not uh, ask anybody not to go and just target very high you should target very high but at the same time if you are getting something don't let it go as such you can grab it and then again there's nobody who stops you targeting very high in order to get a post doc position in an elite and azamin ahmed is asking a question in order to get a post doc position in an elite and reputed university or institution what are the prerequisites uh this is one of the very important questions azamin thank you for asking this question the answer simple is you need a great publication if you have done good work and you happen to publish well number 1 and you have a good cv and a good cover letter which you eventually will do and even if you will not you will not be able to write a good cover letter and good cv in first two or three attempts but you can uh, seek guidance from people around and ask them to see this is you have done how you present your candidature this is the lab you are applying and all that so the first and the most important thing that i would suggest in terms of post doc position availability in a very good institution is to have a very good paper maybe more than one two three papers if you are going for a higher impact factor so you are targeting nature you are targeting pnas one will do for you and if if you have two that's great but if you are not having that high uh, impact papers you have lower ones but but you need to have fairly good and well written papers which will prove which have substantial contribution to the community and once you have that paper that obviously means that you are a good candidate so so that paper works for you that paper is a certificate for you for a page, uh, for, for a post doc position and then again you have to look for networking you have to look for positions available positions from your cover letter and send your cv and then again whenever you apply you please read the papers read the requirements of the lab read their papers read their research and then frame your cover letter accordingly and also then try to get recommendations that you want and a good recommendation will also be a good help hope that makes the answer to the question fazan you're welcome uh the lafros the lafros is asking how is mca regulatory body for phd uh, for phd can they prescribe rules for phd your opinion on this issue uh, this has been the bone of contention for a long time for many institutes like uh, back in aims the issue is that aims is an autonomous body ugc doesn't govern aims so aims has rules from mci so in that case in medical setups most of the phds actually should be governed by mci but again the problem is when these people who come from with a phd from such institutions which are governed by mca do they have an eligibility in in uh, mainstream ugc universities so what actually the question is that you have to balance both of them so in terms of your question that mca should be should mca be a regulatory body for phds i think there should be a research regulatory body which governs all the phds uh, but for that that there, there are so many issues that will take a lot of time and all that because you know ugc governs master courses they govern the colleges academics and at the same time they govern research in the same way mca governs clinics they govern medical paramedical clinical and at the same time they govern the phd norms of these research of, of these uh, clinical uh, medical institutions in the country so whether phd is coming out from these institutions should be governed by ugc is is a question that i think uh, i will have to think more about before i can make a make a, any opinion on it but yes i think there should be a research commission a separate research commission uh separate from the ugc separate from mci because mci is 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 kind of specialized in medical fields so they they really don't have too much of an understanding of basic science researches and then we have a divide in clinical and non clinical they have divide in physics and mathematics and chemistry and biology and on the other extreme we have ugc which governs academics 
to me it appears that there should be a separate research commission there was way back in 2015 and we were trying to look into it and we were trying to present this case that there should be a separate research commission which will govern phd's rather than ugc or rather than this uh, mci because because they, they they really have a divide and you you have separate rules and regulations here and separate rules and regulations here in ugc you have coursework in mca you don't have a coursework that is a problem so actually we need to focus on this issue this is a very important problem where there is a divide there are different logistics there are different rules in different uh, types of these um, regulatory bodies which creates a divide in understanding of the degree itself so there's no uniformity in that case yes i i need a separate research commission would be better than uh, mere mca or ugc uh, zubair ahmed sufi is asking does aims test for only theoretical portions or practical lab aspects are also tested as an appearing candidate no there's no practical test in aims you are tested for a written examination which is objective examination and then subjective examination you qualify these two and then you have to appear in the interview the viva was and then from there in some departments you directly join the lab after the interview you interact with your P pi and then he or she provides you the support letter which you submit with the department this administration and then you are enrolled and in some departments you have a rotation like why chemistry they rotate their candidates in physiology perhaps also they have a rotation they rotate in, the candidates rotate inside and then they get allotted the labs there's no practical test so so yes there's there's absolutely no practical test it's all theoretical examination then there's another question please state what books are regarded as bibles in biosciences in bachelors and masters we should get rid of notes culture in our institutions comments on that please what should students do to embark on this journey to become more competent and skilled uh back then when i was doing my bsc we had people used to say the bible of uh, chemistry is atkins they used to say bible of biochemistry is fryer and some people had the notion that no it's leninger some people say no it's it's another form of leninger that's nelson goss and then we went on further and we found that there's one more book in biochemistry uh in microbiology this was prescott uh in in biochemistry there was this uh you know, white and white then there's there was another one uh, devlin in biochemistry i think there is no single book which is a bible of these subjects and uh it is never a single book that will give you a complete overview of things because an author when he writes a book it is his understanding and his perspective of the book i will not personally prefer to go for notes or writing notes or copying them and photocopying them and distributing them with each other i think and and it's not only one kind of a book uh, for last for past few years there has been a revolution in terms of videos youtube videos tutorials presentations access to the information on the internet i think that has revolutionized all this so so in order to have one book and then sticking to that thinking that you're reading a bible of that subject i don't think that makes a sense uh, because if you have read one book that doesn't mean the all that doesn't mean all the information is uh, accurate information there may be some slight flaws here and there which with the which are too technical for you to understand when you are um, a graduate or a post graduate and uh, i i suppose since th th this is the reason that we have libraries because you don't when you're doing a masters degree you don't need only one you have to if you're reading a topic you have to read it from book a and then from book b and then from book c that serves two purposes one purpose that serves is that when you're reading from book a and then from book e you are repeating you are revising and then you are reading from book 3 what you are doing is actually you are memorizing things and you are getting different perspectives on the same subject i personally like different books i i i read these books these leninger strayer and all that but i person i had never a personal liking for them i i read books which were all together different books for, for understanding neurobiology i i read evolution of human head uh, i read the story of human body 
by David Lieberman, which are just like novels. I read uh, uh, Gut by Julia Anders. So, so all these books which actually take you to a story, which are like, written like nonfiction prose, of rather than the textbooks. I think they give you additional acumen, additional uh, understanding of the subject. In order, in order to get that, it's always better that you read a textbook. Not only one, you read two, three textbooks. That's what the libraries are there for. Go on internet, check YouTube videos. You have a lot of videos coming up there. People are teaching you. They are giving lectures. There are presentations. There are there are documentaries. BBC documentaries are there. The History Channel documentaries are working. There are documentaries on science. And Discovery Channel, they have documentaries on science. Research Channel, they have documentaries on science. There are discussions per se for like, like the Philoctetes Center here in New York. It's a few, it's half a mile away from here. They have beautiful videos where a lot of experts on a particular field come together. Five experts, six experts. Then they discuss the subject inside out, and you have these resources available in addition to your textbooks. And then you have non-fiction prose. And I, I would suggest if you if you have time, you can go for fiction prose also. That also gives you gives you a different understanding of not only the subject but about how the world works you read logic you read epistemology that is going to actually expand your horizon of your knowledge so to me it appears that not only one book is viable but if you have to start with viking history i would suggest we had that uh, everyone had that use and then his son came in and he Give additional inputs in that book. Now it's you, Satyanarayan, and you, Chakrapani, biochemistry, uh, microbiology. We had Pelzer, but then later on Prescott. Yes, chemistry, Atkins, physics. Uh, in my experience, I uh, used to read that book, Finman Lectures in Physics. I never found a book as good as that in physics. But I'm not a physicist, so so don't take this as a word from me. In my sciences, it is biochemistry. Spire is a good book. It's a very good book. I read Devlin. I, I prefer Devlin on Spire. I prefer Devlin on other books like Leninger, Nelson Cox, and and even Boyle and White, White, White and Pratt. All uh, apart from that, it's I think to me my personal uh, uh, favorite will be Devlin in that case in in biochemistry. So yes, uh, I, I think I, I I gave an idea about the books uh, in my subject. In 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 other subjects there are so many. Uh, those who are pursuing actually those who are pursuing hematology, I would suggest them to read Siddhartha Mukherjee's Emperor of All Melodies. Uh, I didn't like his another book, Gene, that was not that good. And Laws of Medicine, his another book was not that good. I didn't like that either. But yes, his first book, Emperor of All Melodies, is very good. It's a wonderful book. That's that's a beautiful book. Uh, uh, it's a must read for many people. Uh, so next question is, uh, Riyaz Shah is asking, how difficult is it to get PhD abroad when compared to PhD in India? What are the differences in terms of preparing for that? What are the benefits and shortcomings in PhD here or abroad? Okay, good. Uh, this is a, a question I actually myself wanted to address. Abroad is a broad term. So uh, uh, when you say abroad, it, it ranges from all the way from China to Hong Kong to South Asian countries to Europe to Middle East to United States of America. So, so a, a simple yes or no is not an answer to this question. In India, there are so many institutions which are very good. Like I have interacted with faculties in Harvard where they said that we know some institutions in India are doing very good. They talk of IITs, but IITs are of engineering sciences. So, so of course, if you're, if you're doing a PhD in physics in IIT, that that would be something. If you if you're doing your PhD in very good institutions in in India. Like people here in, in many places, they know AIMS, they say, yes, AIMS is good. Tata Institute of Fundamental Research is good. So if, if you try to move to China, there are only a few institutions which are good. Other institutions don't have that much uh, credibility. But if you go to Hong Kong, which is a small kind of an NCR of China, that is considered to be a very good research um, uh, in, in the country for research. Singapore is very good. But again, when you travel towards the West, you go to the Middle, Middle East, which, which doesn't have as much uh, good, good uh, reputation in, um, in terms of research, in terms of doing PhD. But they are coming up. There are some institutions now coming up which have uh, really uh, got some good, good credibility around the, around the world. And then you move a slightly more uh, westwards. Uh, you, you reach Austria, 
which is a good place. Then you reach the small places like Tallinn, uh, like Estonia, and then some some small Nordic countries where where it's not that good. It's always better than uh, India is in, in research in India is better than those small European countries. If you go to Eastern Europe, East Northern Europe, but again, when you move slightly northwards and slightly towards you, you you reach Sweden, you reach uh, uh, Norway. They they are doing good research. And then you go down towards the, uh, towards Germany, uh, towards uh, uh, like uh, the the important thing is that Germany and Prague, Germany and Republic of Czech, they are sharing border. Yet there is a huge difference between the research quality in Germany and in Republic of Czech. So it depends on really on different countries. And then I I would personally suggest that if you are not getting a chance of doing a PhD in Germany, uh, France. Switzerland, Finland, Sweden, Norway, then uh, India, India would be a good choice to do a PhD in uh, rather than other small European countries, European pockets. Uh, yes, Hong Kong is a good place, Singapore is a good place, and I would suggest the first choice would always be the United States uh, and then United Kingdom. The United States is important uh, in terms of many things because the quality of research is good and they have certain criteria of taking the uh, students, that is uh, the GRE examination. You have to have good score in GRE in order to get a good research uh, place, uh, good research institution. But nevertheless, uh, uh, India is India is uh, it, 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 many good institutions. They are good. They have well reviewed. Uh, well, in terms of rankings, you may not see them in first hundred or something like that. But uh, in terms of training the students for PhD programs during their PhD programs, they are good. Good. Please comment on the publications uh, from Kashmir University. Biotech, Biochemistry, Biotechnology, Zoology. How can they take the rigged system and shift scholars from simple job hunting mindset to contributive mindset? Uh, I think there are many steps that need to be taken. Number one, the, there should be some annual bulletin where they should be asked to publish or at least to get a bulletin and tell the people what they have done. And the second thing is regarding their publication, it's it, publications don't come overnight. It takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of effort for getting good publications and good papers rather than getting those in those small papers journals which don't have a name and sometimes there are people who feel ashamed to have published in those journals. There are some uh, journals which are being published from Ghaziabad and you, you have to pay a few thousand rupees to them and they will publish your papers. So publishing a paper nowadays is not that direct. It's, it, it, uh, it, it requires a lot of hard work. Not only hard work, it also requires something other than that which is collaborations, which is involvement of many departments, which is involvement of many disciplines so to me it appears that if they really want to move forward the zoology department has to go and talk to department biochemistry botany and then they have to come together and design projects which again boils to the same thing that i was previously talking about that people there have to come up together join write good projects write good grants grant get research grants and once you have money to conduct research then you can conduct good research. You cannot conduct research that your, your scholar is not getting good amount of money, good amount of uh, good salary to sustain, and the salary is coming after six months. The same, uh, the, the scholar is working days and nights, and the salary is uh, he's getting the stipend after six months, if, sometimes even after one year. That shouldn't be the case. The case should be that you have enough of grants, and that once you have enough of grants, you will have enough of facilities available. And once you have enough facilities available, you will have chances to interact with people in other disciplines. When you bring them up, then you publish good. And once you publish good, once you set the wheel rolling, things go on. But for that, you will have to open up. Open up would mean that you will have to welcome other disciplines. And not only open your door, you will have to go out of your door and knock others' doors. And then join hands with each other and try to grow as a community. It is not like you cannot mushroom out as a singular community. It's not the case of a black hole singularity. You have to come up, you have to join hands, you have to collaborate, you have to write good projects and bring in funds and on those funds you have to go further. 
uh, shall I go very blank for a second to be the PhD okay good and uh, who should do PhD what challenge should a student be ready to face on board this journey what are early signs where a student can find out he she is not meant for PhD please talk about the challenge good this is a good question see it's not important for everyone to do PhD and doing a PhD is, does not change your name it does not change it only adds this particular prefix that is the prefix doctor before your name which I don't think should be given that importance unless and until you know actually a PhD is a career which is not economically rewarding it is a demanding career please understand this well you have to understand it well this is the only degree where a student is supposed to know more than his teacher more than his guide because when you take a PhD program it is it, this this particular project that you are taking you have to read it inside out no matter whether your guide reads it inside out you have to be the best in your field in that project best in the world when you are best and then you have to contribute and you have to know something tell the world something that the world has never known before that means that for those moments when you have not published your research you are perhaps the only one who knows that particular slice that particular edge of knowledge which you are doing but again to in order to have that gratification you need to have that perception if you are not having that perception there is no need to go for PhD you are just adding a degree to yourself you are spoiling your years otherwise so you have to be ready number one that it's not an economically rewarding career number one number two it takes time number three it needs a lot of patience if your results are not working and you are feeling like no I, it, it, it's something that's that shouldn't happen and all that then please rethink your decision rethink your decision PhD is not meant for all and PhD is not the metabolism it is not necessary for all it's not necessary that everyone should do a PhD it is just that if you think that you you, you have to take a poor minded decision that I am for PhD I will pursue PhD and I am ready for a career which is highly demanding I am ready for a career which may not give me good economic benefits but at the end of the day at the end of my career maybe two or three decades from now I will have contributed a lot to the world that sense of satisfaction if, if, if you have, have that that particular emotion related to PhD then only go for it otherwise I think it will you, you will face a lot of difficulty and plus don't think that after doing a PhD you are you are job opportunities increase it's the other way around because after doing MSc you go to uh, industry you join industries and you get good positions after doing PhD your salary may increase but most of the these industries don't generally prefer PhDs because PhD is an overqualification for many jobs it does happen if you have done an MSc you go and apply for a call center you are an overqualified you have an MSc, you go and apply for a small lab attendant group, th that is an overqualification again. Uh, MCA is a body of regulating medical degrees and medical PhDs. That is done, okay, uh, post MD is different from PhD requirement for uh, MSc degrees. Another question is that can an assistant professor, professor who doesn't have a PhD degree guide for PhD? Uh, uh, there are two questions. One is that can a professor, assistant prof, associate professor who doesn't have a PhD degree guide be a guide for a PhD? Yes, in medical college it happens. In AIMS it happens. There are many uh, MDs who don't have a PhD in AIMS they guide and they guide PhD students and they become PAs of them. This, this is happening already. And another question is PhD is that done most MD is different from PhD requirement for post MSc degrees. Yes, that is true. That That is true. So so yes, that that's why I was thinking, I was just suggesting that we should have a research commission, a separate research commission, which will, which, which will have definite rules for that. 
actually md and phd are different degrees they are different md is a different degree phd is a different degree it, it, so so they they are really different their methodology is different their understanding is different their purpose is different there's a different purpose you in in md there's a training to uh, training for a clinical purpose there's in in this particular subject it's like masters of medicine but in in phd it's a different thing you you go into the philosophy of the subject So, did I miss any question? Can you please talk about simple points regarding grant writing? Grant writing, so you, you have yourself uh, given an answer to it. Grant writing should be simple. Every uh, agency, every funding agency has its per forma or pro forma or a set format for writing grants. For grant writing, the most important thing is a good idea or a good hypothesis. On that hypothesis, you build up. You build up your story. Then A causes B. Then you have the literature. You go and find out the literature that this is A and this is B. This is the relation between A and B and A causes B. You try to make a story of that. And it's not to be long. It's not, it's not supposed to be very long or very short. Every format will tell you that they need 500 words for this, they need one page for this, they need half a page for this. And the important thing is that the grant should have, when you write a, write a grant, there are three important things that you take into consideration. One is your prior experience in that field. If you have published in that field, your probability of getting the grant is important. So for grant writing, you should have prior experience. Prior experience means that you should have prior publications. That that actually means experience. Even if you don't have publications, but you should have some some doable experience in that field. You should have data that you call the pre preliminary data. Preliminary data would mean that you are doing some kind of research, you are proposing a hypothesis, and in that line you have some data. You have already worked out something that gives you an idea that the hypothesis that you are proposing is correct that this hypothesis may work. And number one, number two, and number three, you must have grantsmanship. Grantsmanship is that you must have read the subject well, and you must be able to articulate your hypothesis in such a way that you say, this is this has been already done. This is uh, what has not been done. This is the lacuna in the literature. And this is where the project that I'm proposing comes into so you have to wild, wield the story in such a way in 500 words to a literature survey and then uh, choose a suitable title. And then for the completing the hypothesis, you will have to add certain points, one, two, three, four points. These are the objectives through which the whole of your grant, uh, you, your actually your idea for which you're writing a grant is uh, getting through. Uh, Can you please talk about simple points regarding grant writing? Okay, I talked about this. Please comment on women in science in Kashmir. What are the challenges that Kashmir, Kashmir, Kashmir women faces generally? Face generally, and can we do? What can we do to overcome them? Uh, previously, I had this idea that there are a lot of problems uh, Kashmiri women are facing in terms of the research. I don't think they are facing only in research. They are, they are facing problems in everything. In academics, in, in women, women per se in all over the world are facing a lot of problems. It's, it's, it's very difficult to be a woman and again, uh, try to fight. So I, I respect that sentiment. I respect womanhood for that matter. And with respect to Kashmir, it has been a little more difficult because of and number of things but given that i think kashmiri women are doing still far better than what what the what the situations are as when 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 we take it all in terms of the situations in terms of the the environment that they're fighting with i think they are doing far better than expected that that, that is my idea now uh, talking of their coming out of uh, that that kind of a stereotype i think to me, it appears that uh, people, as is very evident from Kashmir scientists group, that many of the active people there are actually females, and they are doing quite wonderful. And 
it, it makes me happy that that it's not only one gender that is being represented there and i think this is representative of the kashmiri uh, research community all over the world so what we need to do is actually we need to discuss these projects out we need to discuss these issues out maybe on the kashmir scientist group on or some other platforms and try to find out what are their problems and how we, how we as a community come up with solutions to those problems and support them well uh zubair ahmed sofi uh, asks until phd here in kashmir we aren't able even to see a live cell division or gene or different cell or uh, different cell or hormone then how can we expect from ourselves that we can do a good phd i think we kashmir students feel handicapped in terms of experiments microscope and different techniques i outside outside jnk particularly i am talking about zoology and botany students how can we overcome this particularly uh i can understand this is really frustrating when you don't have a facility and you want to do good and as you said that it's difficult even to see a cell division uh under the microscope i i would suggest you there are uh, there are some of the ways that we can try for one is that you try to come out for short term trainings look for the labs that are doing your kind of work outside the uh, state outside jnk and then try to look for them in delhi in bangalore in maybe in iisc bangalore in in other reputed institutions and try to approach them ask them that if you come could you come for a training you want to do such and such experiments and the good thing is that if that lab is already working in that direction they, you you can present yourself as as a volunteer who will work and who will learn during that time that is one thing the other thing is the kashmiri people the, the people from valley kashmir scientists who are all over the world in in, in uh, parts of india they they can be contacted that see you want to learn this you want to see this is there is there a possibility that you can come out to the lab and then take a training for two months take a training for six months do these experiments with them and then they try to help you out that yeah, okay i have this project going on i i will i will talk to my pi or if, if he is himself a pi then he will say okay come over and then try to do it this is really a problem but i think we all have to come together for this and then you will have to if, if you are person, uh, personally feeling this problem i would suggest you to just write me an email i will try to look for some solution for you uh, for this problem uh, I, i'll be happy to help you for this problem industrial postdoc versus academic postdoc why one should uh, okay which one you should opt for i think they are both good uh industrial postdoc as well as an academic postdoc provided you are able to publish good and your experience grows so so it's like you are doing a postdoc in a if you if you are doing a postdoc in a very good institution and at the end of the day or at the end of the year, your two years you are not getting a good paper even if it's a very good institution you are working somewhere of a university of the state of harvard you didn't publish well that in matter so if you did your postdoc in some okay university or maybe in in uh, industrial is an industrial postdoc and when you happen to have some good findings and you published well bingo you're there so so the issue is not actually which page which postdoc you chose issue is what work you chose what group you choose and what uh, what work did you publish that is important rather than uh, industrial postdoc or academic postdoc and then again it depends on your interest that if you are, if you want to do some basic sciences and do some finding on basic sciences you go to the basic sciences if you want to do something regarding and have uh, more more towards patterns and something then you you can join industrial postdoc but ultimately what happens is what, what is important is actually what you publish at the end of the postdoc uh is it possible to do research project directly after masters in aims for getting a pre phd experience yes it is possible there are so many people who have done it uh said duraksha sakina uh, it's it's a very important uh, question and there are people who have done it and uh, when i was uh, myself being msc i went for 6 months training in aims and that gave me a good um, overview of all those uh, areas that are that are working on and not not only uh, me there were so many people who came from valley there were other parts of 
India also, but I think from Kashmir there are so many people who came to AIMS and they, mm -hmm. then they worked there for some time and got some pre phd experience and which which of course i think which which gives people uh, the candidates some edge when they sit in the examination because they already know what kind of work is going on in the department they already have an understanding of it it's easy for them to qualify the examination and then when you sit in the interview in the viva uh, you already are able to present you 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 have some kind of research experience of that particular project that you that gives you an edge this is a good thing and if you wish to do that i would suggest i would i would support that 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 is a good decision nasir ahmed loan asks how to write cover letter for food oppositions cover letter writing is it's like it's it's, one of the, it's like showing somebody your face so cover letter is it it's to be tuned to the lab in which you are applying so roughly i would i would write you like this there are three parts of the cover letter in the very first part you introduce yourself see i am this fellow and i have done this this is my phd these were my finds that's the first paragraph of the cover letter i'm just giving you a rough uh, uh, outline of the cover letter. and the second paragraph of your cover letter has to give the idea that since you are working on this this is the reason i'm working uh, i'm uh, interested in your lab these are the papers you've published and this is how my experience add to your uh, uh, are actually a complement uh, to your uh, lab work so it's like first paragraph about yourself, your PhD, very short paragraph, something like this and that. And then you go on to tell that since you're working on this and my experiences are, these are my experiences and this is how they are in line with your projects, your aims, your objects, objectives. And the third one, third part goes that you have to present your candidature where you want to see yourself in terms of being a part of their lab and how you would be able to contribute in terms of your experiences, in terms of your interests, and where you would like to see in the next 10 years. So if you keep these three things in mind, then you would be able to draft a very good cover letter. I hope I answered this question. Uh, uh, did I miss any question? If I missed any question, I would. Uh, Request somebody to then tell me if I miss. Uh, industrial postdoc, corporation postdoc, you get paid well, patent. Uh, I think I think patent is something that you can get in academic uh, academic postdocs also. So pay, patent is not necessarily a, a part of uh, the industrial postdoc. But yes, there are higher chances of getting a patent, and it's not necessary that you get paid well in industrial postdoc. There are some postdocs in universities which get very high uh, salaries, which get very high salaries. So it's it's not like that you get paid well in 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 the still postdocs. Uh, there are chances, and some chances yes, on an average maybe higher, but not. That. How do you find Croatian scientist group? Do you think this group is growing and growing for a good cause? And please give suggestions how we can collectively improve. Uh, Riaz Shah, I think. I, I got introduced to the group, uh, I think, in 2017, and and when I joined the group, I was extremely happy to see such a group. And uh, in fact, I felt ashamed that I had not started any such group long back. But then we already had a group where there were around 5,000 members, and which is a bliss. So it is not like how I find the group. It's, it's, it's beyond my opinions now. The group is working exceptionally well and they will, uh, hopefully, I'm, I'm sure they will be working great. They, they'll be doing good good work in future also. And I think, of course, there's always a room to improve. So, so suggestions will come up and with time they would, they, would, they would improve further and further and further and lead to the betterment of the society in terms of research and development. So I think uh, we have come to the end of it. Uh, if, if there are no further questions, and I think I have dealt with the PhD system of AIMS, how you can prepare. And I think, thank you very much. It was wonderful talking to you all. 
uh, and I'm, I'm again sorry because there were some technical issues when we started and since it's it's already midnight here it's 2 15 here so <laughs> 2 15 the night uh, it was really wonderful talking to you all uh, i would i would uh, love to interact with you everyone who, who have, if there are any questions i didn't answer i would love them to send them to me and i, I would try to respond to them uh, while i was uh, while i'm offline thank you very much and wish you all a great career and wish that uh, Urshi scientists, scientists from Valley, thrive all over the world, make their mark, and be successful always, inshallah. Okay, Asalaamu Alaikum.